So I will do the introduction, and I think after that, uh, David can, uh, if David can read the questions. Though the, the um, today's uh, seminar is, will I will present this population um, PBPK modeling. So it's a combination of uh, population modeling, uh, statistical approach, uh, with PBPK modeling, and we use the parametric and non-parametric methods that are available in SimSIP. And we compared them to Bayesian samplers that had the double advantage of actually uh, having a check of uh, whether the SimSIP simulator uh, works similarly to Bayesian sampler. And also, actually, uh, the Bayesian sampler should be coherent to, to the SimSIP simulator uh, results. And, and we do need um, experience in, in uh, the various methods. Though this um, this is a SimSIP webinar series. It will be recorded. All the attendees are auto muted. And if you want to ask a question, you can do so at any time. Please raise your hand. And alternatively, you can type in the chat box. And uh, uh, David uh, will um, will stop me and um, pose your question. Um, so this is being recorded. And it will be available on YouTube following the presentation. So this is myself. Uh, <laughs> I uh, got a PhD in uh, pharmacy, actually, uh, from a French university in Nancy, and then a, a PhD in toxicology. I did postdoctoral work at uh, various American universities. Um, and I then worked at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab and also in a, an institute in France, um, mostly doing research in, for various um, various institution or administration, as you can see, of the European Commission. Um, so I am currently, uh, since about three years now, a uh, senior scientific advisor, and I head the mechanistic modeling team at the uh, Certara SimSIP division. So um, yeah, as I mentioned briefly, the topics uh, today will be to compare the results obtained a minimal PBPK model for uh, theophylline uh, and a data set of uh, theophylline uh, plasma concentration data on 18 subject. Um, and we will use the quasi random parametric expectation <laughs> maximization algorithm, uh, short name QRPEM. Um, also, and this is available in SimSIP, the non parametric adaptative grid estimation method and PAG. Um, and also two Bayesian algorithms, the Bayesian Metropolis Hastings algorithm and Hamiltonian Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. I will briefly describe the, not, not the details of the method, but the gist of them. Um, so basically, you know, I, what we will show, uh, maybe I'm <laughs> selling the point already, uh, the strong coherence between the four approaches tested. Um, I will go into the details and, and we hope that, you know, you, you will be with those methods able to better uh, calibrate your PBPK model or missing parameters in your PBPK models and uh, also have a, a greater confidence in, in the analysis you can make. If you have any question, please email me at uh, this uh, email address, frederic.bois at I Oh, I would like this to disappear, but it doesn't want me. Okay. So this is a presentation of work we, we published actually um, earlier this year. Um, and this article is, uh, you can get it from CPT Pharmacometrics and Systems Pharmacology. And these are my various collaborators, Janak, Antonia, Siri, Hiroshi, Robert Leary, Mike Dunlavey, Richard Matthews, Khaled Masood, and myself. So first, let's go into why, why, why do you want to do fitting in SimSIP? You know, we know that bottom-up modeling, mechanistic modeling is much more robust for prediction, extrapolation than top-down approaches. So why not always do bottom-up modeling? Well, in some cases, you know, there may be information for some key parameters that is missing. Uh, we do not have the in vitro data. We, 
and or the information can be obtained easily from clinical trial analysis or animal experiments. And in which case you would want to use those in vivo data to, um, to extract some parameter values or improve some parameter values, or understand what is going on. So um, for example, uh, that's also another point. Information can be needed on average values for some parameters in human and animal population, but also on their variance in the population. Okay, um, you know that the quality of clinical trial prediction depends at the same time on average, um, the value of the averages you use, but also the values of the variances you use for the uh, simulation for the various parameters of your models. And to answer this need, that's, that is why we have developed parameter estimation in the SimSIP simulator. So uh, instead of doing um, basically forward simulation prediction, you can use this parameter estimation module, which loops through a parameter to estimate to better fit your data. So that's the, the principle of it. Um, and that is why we have developed since about, you know, now 10 years, uh, capabilities for parameter estimation. There was parameter estimation, weightedly square mostly. Um, and then uh, more recently, we have introduced population um, pharmacokinetic analysis or population fitting, if you want, with QRPM and NPAG that we will, um, we will describe. Um, we have improved it in version 20, making it faster. Um, in version 21 last year, we introduced multiple species fitting. That is, you can put together data from multiple sp species and basically fit them um, to obtain a, a parameter value that would be um, common to all. And in this year, in the next release, uh, we have introduced fitting across multiple human scenarios. That is, um, very different workspaces, uh, and they could correspond to um, very different uh, dosages, or even different models or, or different populations, um, and um, assuming that at least some parameters are common uh, among all those and can be uh, fitted, uh, calibrated um, reasonably, then you, can, you will be able to use this, um, this extension of fitting. So how uh, is fitting done in SimSIP? Well, I, I, we are using very standard principles. So um, bear with me, this is very standard, but just to rehash, um, parameter estimation is finding for some or all parameters, the combination of their values that will lead to the best fit to some data. But what is the best fitting model? There are two approaches. The maximum likelihood principle says the best fitting model maximizes the probability of observing the data. How is that obtained? Very briefly, you have a model, this blue curve here, sort of pharmacokinetic model, and you have data points, which are red dots. Now, you can compute, if you assume that the model is correct, that's the assumption, you can test it after, obviously. You can assume that the data should be distributed if the model is correct, say normally, because of random errors in the uh, measurement process, normally around this uh, prediction, and you can estimate, if you define the standard deviation of the error, you can estimate what is the density of that data point, or the probability, if you want, Probability density would be the most correct term of this data point under this um, uh, parametric curve, basically this error model. And each point uh, has a different density. And obviously, you know, if a point is right on the line, it will have the highest density in this case. Um, and so the likelihood of your data is basically the product of all those densities. So if the model is basically not passing through the point approximately very far, the densities will be very small and the likelihood will be very small. So you want to maximize the likelihood. And as I said, the maximum likelihood will be obtained if your model passes exactly through each data point, which is probably not possible. But um, that's the, uh, the principle of it, okay? We just want 
we want to maximize the probability of uh, observing the data by changing parameter values. There is a Bayesian estimation which adds something. It is still the probability of observing the data that you want to optimize, but you multiply it by the probability, the prior probability of the parameter to estimate. What is the prior probability? Well, it's a bet fundamentally, or it can correspond to prior knowledge you have on the parameter of interest. Uh, before doing the fitting. Say, for example, somebody tells you, yeah, well, you know, this parameter should be around zero with, I would say, a standard deviation of two or three. Um, this is prior uh, knowledge. That may be expert knowledge and that may be uh, better um, founded with uh, previous data, but you can do that. In any case, with either method, the Bayesian or the classical frequentist model, a link is required between the model and the probability of observing the data. Well, the link is actually those little black Gaussian curves. And this is a data model. It's a model of the observation process, of its errors, the, the way the data were collected. In some cases, it's maybe the number of animals you have looked at. It may be some aspect of the procedure. So that's your data model. That's a key ingredient. In addition, obviously, to the structural PK model that will define where the curve passes here and what is the link between parameter values of interest and, and those predictions. So SimSip allows you to do individual fitting, population PK fitting, cross species fitting, and cross workspace fitting by order of generality. I already said that, but let's go into some bit more detail how this is done. For individual fitting, population fitting, or cross species fitting, this is how the thing works, basically. Individual fitting, you have the different subjects here, and basically a parameter, say I want to fit one parameter, FA, okay, fraction absorbed. Fraction absorbed is fitted to the data for subject one, you get a fraction absorbed for subject one, the fraction absorbed for subject two, and one for subject three. And this is done by weighted least square minimization. Okay, so there is no prior information used here. That's very simple. Now, in population fitting, and we will see, this is done in SimSip with QRPM or NPAG, and this is like maximum likelihood uh, method, or likelihood maximization. What you have is a bit more complicated model. Not only do you estimate one parameter value per person, per subject in your study, but you also want to estimate at the same time a population mean and a population variance and eventually covariances between parameters. Um, the trick and, and the sophistication of the method is that, in fact, your estimate of the population mean and variance should depend on those values, but also on the uncertainty in those individual values. Uh, a naive approach would be to just do individual fitting and say, oh, okay, for me, my, this is value for my people. Then I form the average of those three values and I do the variance of those three values and these are my population variances and population averages. This will not be correct and you will um, underestimate the, the precision and the variability of your um, population parameters. This is a correct approach. Okay. Now, in cross species fitting, we do something a bit different because the needs are a bit different here. What we have, we have different subjects, which may be from different species, but we are estimating through a fixed effect model, that's a technical term, but we are estimating only one parameter that we hope will fit the data from the different subject in the different species. And this is weighted least square minimization. Okay, so that's somewhat simpler than this. I mentioned coming this year, the cross human trial fitting, and there you will be able to do at the same, or not at the same time, sorry, either uh, fixed effect modeling, that is you put different um, workspaces and associated data, 
And the software will consider this is all one big study and will estimate a common parameter for all of them. Okay, a bit more sophisticated is to allow for the, um, or quite more sophisticated, is to allow for variability in the subject values and we fall back on the population approach uh, with QRPM on NPAG um, and you will be able to, to perform this optimization again with different subjects and uh, different eventually population or even different models in any case uh, placed in different or attached to different workspaces which will be considered as again together a big a big study okay so well, that was a, a quick presentation of the in if you want the structure of the of the study statistical model that are used in SIMSIP. Now, the main component for uh, putting in place parameter estimation, you have to basically a preparation phase, you have to specify your data model, you have to decide whether it could be fixed effect or population modeling. You have to decide, obviously, what is the PK, uh, the exact shape or form of your PBPK model, and um, you have to decide what parameters you will fit, obviously, and you can do that and help get help from sensitivity analysis because you do not want to fit a parameter that has no effect on the prediction or on the time course, for example, if you have time course data of the variable of interest because it will not be identifiable. Then you choose the estimation mode that is actually somewhat linked to the data model, but it can be individual, population, cross species, cross population, as I mentioned. And then you go into the parameter estimation module and you can choose depending on wh whether, as I said, you do individual population, weighted least square, or maximum likelihood, the choices will be made automatically, the options available. Um, then when you do weight weighted least square, you have all those methods and will not go into those today. I will concentrate on QRPM and NPAG for maximum likelihood in population fitting. And then you have all the checking and, and diagnostics that come with it as output of the parameter estimation. Okay, so let me go through QRPM, NPAG and the Bayesian methods and explain to you briefly what they are. So what is QRPM? This is a like maximum uh, likelihood maximization algorithm, as I described. So you want to maximize the probability of your observation, and it is specifically tuned for population PK. Okay, so you can use it to estimate population means and variance, subject level values, that is subject specific values. Um, you can even go down one level and uh, estimate occasion level values. That's a, a specialization of it. Um, you can also force the population variance to zero, but in this case it becomes a fixed effect model. It is quite powerful, has many options. We will not go into the, uh, how to use it in detail, um, but note that it is slower than weighted least square because it does a lot more work um, because the estimation of population level parameters jointly with the individual uh, parameters is, you know, difficult. Um, and okay, well, this is the population uh, hierarchical model. Uh, people at these uh, individual values here, population uh, parameters over, above. Um, technically, it is derived from expectation, from the expectation maximization algorithm. So I will just explain how the expectation maximization algorithm works. It, it is described in the, in, in, it has been described in the literature. So you first start with initial population parameter estimate, your first guesses, okay? A mean and an SD, okay? And with that, by Monte Carlo sampling many individuals, you actually many times each individual in your population, you generate basically predictions which you compare with your data and on the basis of data fit, you can basically assign probabilities to those various Monte Carlo uh, samples. So some samples will have higher probability because, you know, 
they predict the data better, they fit the data better, and, and some will have lower probability because they don't fit the data well. So you get that, you resample part of your values, okay? And now what you do, you will maximize the data likelihood, so that was the expectation step. You generate Monte Carlo sample and reweight it. Now you will maximize the data likelihood by fitting the error model parameters because typically in population model, you do not assume that you know the uh, residual error. Um, you can fit it and you can use, you know, constant error or proportional error. It, 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 it's a choice, modeling choice. It's different, uh, you can try different combinations. In any case, based on all those predictions, you maximize what is the value of your uh, error model parameters. And then that's the first step. Then you redo Monte Carlo sampling. Okay. You reweight, you remaximize, and you do that n times, as you see. And after well, sufficient time, typically mm, around 50, approximately, it's rather fast, uh, uh, iterations, you get your results. And now your results are basically estimates of the population parameters, of the individual parameters, and of the uh, error model parameters, your, your residual errors. Okay. QRPM improve on the previous schemes. Um, basically, two major improvements. Uh, it uses importance reweighting, um, and this is much faster. It is much faster than the standard uh, EM algorithm. Um, you can uh, you can see here. This is a sample size, and this is how quickly we we converge to the minimum, and and basically uh, the uh, QRPM converge faster than the EM or other algorithms. The second improvement over EM that we we put in QRPM, which was actually developed by your colleagues in Phoenix, um, is that we use quasi-random Sobol numbers for Monte Carlo uh, simulation. So instead of random numbers, we use those um, Sobol <laughs> random numbers, and they cover the, uh, the, the space of interest more quickly and more uniformly than purely um, random numbers. Okay. So that converges also faster. Oh, in the article, but this is just basically showing uh, and without the sequential aspect, what I just said, um, this is a, a figure that is in the article, so you can go back to it. I encourage you to read this article. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, you obtain population and subject level parameters and estimate with standard error, confidences interval, and all the diagnostic plots you would want. That was QRPM, a parametric method. So why parametric? Because it assumed that, uh, actually that's a big assumption, that the subjects in, in the populations are um, normally distributed around the mean. Um, or ergonomically distributed. You can choose either one, but this is just a transformation. So it assumes a particular distribution, and in particular, a unimodal distribution. That is, it assumes that the population that you're looking at of subject for which you have your PK data is homogeneous, at least with respect to the parameters that you're trying to fit. Um, so this is a case of uh, most uh, parametric algorithm, most by definition. Um, they assume, um, and typically, uh, let's say, normal or log normal uh, population distributions. What if this is not true? Well, then your data model is wrong, and, and your population parameter estimate may mean nothing, because what it will do, you may have basically assume that this is a true distribution of a parameter, um, say FA. Uh, in my, again, uh, in my population, I have two modes, two groups of people. I, I should try to, when I discover that, I should try to understand what is really the physiological differences between them. But uh, first, if, if I have this and I am trying to fit just using a, a standard parametric method, like your PM, SAEM, um, trying to fit 
um, a model, it will tell me, oh yeah, yeah, okay, um, yeah, the mean is here. Well, there's nobody at this mean, and and the standard deviation is that, um, <laughs> which doesn't reflect at all basically the structure of the true population. So. In QRPM and any parametric method, you should check a posteriori that your subject parameter estimate do not clearly, after fitting, fall into clumps, into, into groups of people, because otherwise you have a problem. If they do, well, <laughs> you don't have much choice. Either you can segregate people into two groups and redo fitting for group one and group two separately, but then you may not know exactly what to do with the people in the middle here, if you have any. Um, but you can try a non-parametric method because non-parametric methods do not make a, a, such an assumption of unimodality or a particular distribution here. Okay, so that's the advantage of it. There is an advantage to uh, non-parametric method is that typically they require a large number of subjects, more than 30. And I will show you an exercise with 18 only and you will see what happens. Um, very simply, I don't want to show you any formula or anything complicated. Um, again, we start with a sample of virtual individuals. Imagine that they are like grid point in the parameter space and you compute their likelihood. OK, now there is a little parametric assumption here. There is a Gaussian error model, just a measurement error. It will simply be Gaussian. And then you add or remove virtual subjects, OK, randomly and iteratively. Each virtual subject has um, their own probability. And at the end, only the n, if you have n subject in your data set, only the n most probable subjects are kept for inference, or n or less. Okay, so this is all the discretization of the population. Um, so it's a bit particular, and the result look like this. So um, this is a given parameter and you see the result. So it gives for each value, um, each point basically corresponds to a person. So we are looking, say this is person one, this is the K for person one, and this is the VSS for person one. So we are looking at it marginally um, and each uh, value is associated with a probability. Okay. Uh, the population mean are computed as weighted average. Okay over the final grid point. So as you make a weighted average, weighted by the probability of those data. Population variances and subject specific estimates are obtained by bootstrapping subject because you can bootstrap subject according to this probability. Um, so that's all done automatically in SimSip. Um, but again, beware, you know, if really is your uh, population is multimodal, uh, you will get a population mean and population variance, but they do not do not make much sense. You have to uh, think for yourself. OK, maybe I want to segregate my people and report this. I mean, so you, you, are, you want to take this into account, the fact that there would be nobody at the mean, for example. OK, so that was QRPM and NPAG, two uh, algorithm population um, pharmacokinetic analysis um, uh, algorithm that you can use in SimSip. Um, and we wanted to compare them to Bayesian numerical methods. So I told you the Bayesian method, they will take into account a prior. In this case, we wanted to do a fair comparison. So we put flat priors, uh, which means almost um, no particular choice or did not influence the, uh, the choice of, of the final result with the prior. Um, so in fact, this is doing almost maximum likelihood um, practically uh, with a Bayesian uh, algorithm. So it should give us approximately the same results. In any case, Bayesian methods give you a sample of parameter values from their posterior distribution. Okay, uh, what is the posterior distribution? Well, it is simply the product of a prior distribution. So you assign a prior distribution to your parameter you, you want to estimate. So you say, maybe you can say something pretty vague. You can say, oh, 10 with an SD of five, but you could also say 10 with an SD of eh, 50, uh, if you want it to go negative or log normal, what, whatever you want. You can use any prior you want. So it can be pretty uninformative. And as I said, 
um, technically we, we used a uniform prior between white bounds for for this uh, for our paper. So, but I want to show you what what happens with a uniform uh, non-uniform prior. So you define a prior, and then the data likelihood. Well, you haven't computed it yet, obviously, but it is somewhere lurching in the dark, um, and basically. The data likelihood, if it is nicely behaved, like here, will tell you, well, my data or your data um, rather point to a value of the parameter or, or how you are know, best fitted, uh, have maximum likelihood when the parameter is about seven here. Okay. And it say, well, those values below five, five or four are quite unlikely. Value beyond 12 are quite unlikely to. So that's the likelihood. That's what we are maximizing actually in, um, in QRPM, for example. And in the Bayesian context, the posterior we are aiming at is a product. So it's just a product. Huh? There is a little technical point. Uh, the product of the prior by the likelihood, and it is this curve. In this case, you can actually see something. The, date, the, the data, the likelihood of the data is quite a narrow peak here. And the prior has an influence. It shifts the posterior a little bit, but by not much. Um, so typically, you know, if you perform an experiment, it's because you do not know too many things about the parameter of interest. Otherwise, you would not do that. Um, so typically, you do not have much information and the um, the data will bring information and typically the posterior is really more conditioned by the data than by your prior which is important which means that we are using the data it's not you should not be um, paralyzed by <laughs> what uh, some people say that oh you put a prior yeah, therefore you influence your your estimates a lot etc most of the case that is not true and you can actually test whether or not the assumptions you've made about your prior are really an impact significant impact on your posterior okay you can take um, oh, I, yeah, I, I say the product. Well, there is a, a normalization constant that you need to uh, to do this plot. I had to prop up a bit this posterior, otherwise it would have uh, would not have a, uh, the, the the correct uh, height. But um, the algorithm we use do not worry about that. Um, they do not need to have this normalization. Technically, the posterior distribution is an update of the prior distribution by the information contained in the data via the data likelihood. That is why this is theoretically consistent. Okay. Um, <clears throat> note that when you do population PK modeling in a Bayesian context, you can use parametric or non-parametric methods again. Uh, and here uh, we used a parametric assumption uh, Gaussian like uh, QRPM does again for uh, for comparison with them. OK, <clears throat> now I say Bayesian method will give you numerical methods, will give you a sample of parameter values from their posterior distribution, which is complicated. So how do we do that? We use adaptative Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations. OK, so let's start with an example of simple Monte Carlo simulation. OK. Monte Carlo simulation sampling uh, parameter normally around 0 0.5 with a deviation of sigma at the different steps. What you have is the parameter is always sampled from the same distribution. OK, so at the end, the distribution of the values that here that have been selected at the various iterations, this is not MCMC, it should be Monte Carlo, are um, basically always the same distribution, normal, normal 0.5 with a deviation of sigma. Okay. What is a mark of chain Monte Carlo simulation? It's a variant that proceeds by sampling a new parameter value from a distribution that depends on the previous value. Okay, so I will sample first first value for my parameter. Okay, uh, I can start from anywhere actually, and then what I will do, I will move to this value and resample a new value with that 
previous value as a mean. Okay. So the mean is changing all the time and is a previous value. And this basically, so you can go, whoops, sorry, I went too far. This has a different behavior. And actually, in this case, it is a simple random diffusion. So actually, it could wander off to infinity. Um, <clears throat> if you want to sample from a specific posterior distribution, there are variants to do that, to do this uh, little jump from one um, <clears throat> value to the next. And in our paper, we used Metropolis Hastings and Hamiltonian MCMC sampling. I don't have time to explain to you really how this is working. <clears throat> you can go to the detail there and in the literature, which is kind of huge. I just wanted to give you, explain to you the, the, the gist of it. Um, the gist of those method is essentially that if the newly sampled value has a higher posterior probability, basically fits the data better, then the jump is accepted and you move on. If the new value that you're trying to sample gives you a worse probability, a worse fit to the data than you currently have, then you jump to it, you accept it sometimes. I'm not going to go into the details of when, <laughs> but um, so if you accept this jump, you move on. If not, you just retry um, a new uh, a new value um, using the previous uh, starting from the from the previous value you had sampled. Okay, so that's quite simple to explain. And such a scheme, which actually you see it in uh, operation here, it, it it moves basically as it, made, it, it starts from anywhere. Monte Carlo simulation would just be stable. It is not stable, but it converge, it stabilizes um, and gives you sample from the posterior distribution. And this is, yeah, this has been proven to work if it is correctly implemented. And so the results you get are just samples of parameter vectors from their joint posterior distributions. Okay, it is just a table of parameter values, one column per parameter and one row per uh, sample. Okay, uh, and, and you can for mean SDs histogram. This is an example of histogram for one column. Uh, you can also even plot two columns versus the other, and you can actually check whether you have correlation a posteriori in, in your in your um, in your sampled values between your parameter estimates, basically. OK, that was the methods. Now, what did we do? So we applied QRPM and PAG and those two Bayesian tools to the analysis of those theophylline data. Or administration of immediate release tablets of theophylines to 18 male and female subjects. We do not know the sex of the subject, actually. We do have information about their age, but it's in shape of an interval from 19 to 31. Um, and uh, we have information about their body mass for most subjects, but not for all. Um, and there, as I said, that's an actual mutual benchmarking uh, validation of the Bayesian uh, tools, but uh, of the SimSIP tool at the same time. So yeah, uh, people were subject, uh, subjects were uh, followed for about 20 hours. And you can see the, the, the range of responses. They get different doses and they, they are clearly different. Uh, there is an absorption phase. N note that this is a log time just to see the first, just so that we could see the first phase. Otherwise, after that, it's, it's pretty much a, a linear decrease here. So the PPPK model we used it for theophylline is not too, too complicated. It is enough to use a, a, a minimal PPPK model. So we have a systemic compartment. Just one systemic compartment is enough. There is a liver. Portal vein is actually um, sort of a shadow compartment. Um, it, it is actually computed uh, as uh, equilibrium at any time. Input from the uh, small intestine, so the dose basically <coughs> permeate here with FAKA standard. Uh, um, there is no gut metabolism assumed here. There is hepatic clearance, um, and that's CYP1A2 clearance mostly, we assumed. 
Uh, so we fitted actually uh, in this um, model, we fitted uh, the um, volume of the systemic compartment, actually the volume of steady state. We fitted Ka, the absorption rate here, and we fitted also the Vmax um, um, of the um, of the metabolism of pheophilin. This is a structural model, and that is actually the parameter dependency model. You know that in, in PVPK model, obviously the equation, the model is very important, but um, you realize, and this is particularly true from, from SIMSIP and, and uh, the hundreds, if not thousands of parameters it has, is um, that the parameter dependency model is also very important. And this is uh, for this uh, little model, uh, they, the, the, the most important um, dependencies between parameters. For example, you can see that uh, age, as I was saying, uh, conditions, or you could say the reverse, Height depends on age. Body mass is supposed to depend on height. Uh, GFR depends on body mass, but also on age. And also um, there's, there's a covariate that you can uh, measure creatinine. And you have all those dependencies here um, in, this, in this model. So uh, basically, again, what we fit here for this, um, for this exercise is the Vmax, the VSS, um, volume distribution of steady state, K and Vmax for the individual subject at the population level and uh, this sigma one, which is the error model. It has two components, a relative error term and a proportional error term. And these are the results we obtain, basically. So this is the fit to the data, the fit we obtain with QRPM here, for example. And it is an excellent fit. You, you can see basically um, that the um, each time the subject are correctly predicted. The, the, the little gray line that wander off is uh, a comparison to the population mean, which, which is showing just how different the subject is from the mean. But if you focus on the subject data themselves, it's all um, they are the best fit is in, in dark, the confidence interval are indicated by uh, the, the the little dotted line and the, uh, the green areas. So fit is excellent, and but this is true for about all methods. Um, the This is predicted value, observed value, so if the fit was perfect, it would fall on the line here. And you can see the result, well, actually, uh, yeah, it would take a bit a while to go into the detail, but for the various estimation methods, QRPM, NPAG, Hamiltonian, MCMC or MCMC, the, the fits are very, very similar and they all fall within uh, not even uh, a factor, this is a factor two, not even that. So um, uh, the, the strayest point here, the, the worst fit is, is actually obtained with the Hamiltonian MCMC, but just for that point, and it is yeah a bit better with the other method, but you know there, there, there is a, a compromise bit, between the, the, the various methods do not fit exactly the same way the, all the data, but they fit pr uh, pretty much uh, pretty much the same results in terms of fit, but also as we can see here, maybe more importantly. Depends if you're interested more in the subject uh, that you're looking at or if you're more interested in the population, but the population and individual estimates were consistent across all the methods. Um, you can see here that population uh, estimate of Vmax using, oh, sorry, yeah, so this is QRP, um, sorry, this is uh, Hamilton and MCMC, this is Metropolis Hastings in second, this is QRPM, so the first are two Bayesian methods. They give distributions, which are figured by this little violin. This is a frequentist method, so it gives you a best estimate and confidence intervals. And this is NPAG. NPAG doesn't give you estimates of uncertainty about your parameter estimate because it is sample based. And you remember this is this discrete sample. So this is a estimate for K, also very consistent. Estimate for VSS, maybe a bit lower, but, but not by much uh, for uh, QRPM and NPAG. The SDs, ah, for the SDs, we have coherence between co the, the parametric method, QRPM, 
um, and PAG and the Bayesian method. Sorry, not NPAC, QRPM or the Bayesian method. But NPAC gives a different value, gives higher values here for the uh, um, uh, standard deviation of the max in the population, variability of the max of the population or K in the population, and a, a lower point for the estimate of uh, variance. And these are the estimates pretty consistent also over the error term. Um, uh, the constant error or the proportional error, proportional error term. I will come back to why is NPAG uh, a bit um, different and uh, this shows a slightly different view of the population estimate and maybe you will understand better what is happening with NPAG. So um, in, in dark QRPM, in red the estimates um, uh, yeah, we, we transform um, mean and, and, and confidence interval into a distribution for QRPM. Um, in red, Hamiltonian MCMC in green, um, Metropolis Hastings, and, and the impact points are figured here. What is happening is that, you know, with 18 subjects, we only have 10 final support point or 10 final virtual subject for NPAG estimates. I mentioned that the number is between one and um, and would have could be between one and 18. It turns out that only uh, 10 um, final support points were obtained. And first, there is no clear evidence that the subject fall in different groups, but we don't have that many subjects, but Okay, we don't have a pack here and a pack there. Um, so the parametric inference of normality is reasonable. And also, when you have so few subjects estimating the variance at the population level is not very stable. Uh, and this is why um, typically this is overestimated for, for those two and underestimated for those ones. Compared to what the QR, to, to, compared to what the parametric methods give. But in the case of a homogeneous population like this one, apparently um, the, um, the the parametric method should work well. So we are already reaching the, the, the conclusions, basically. Um, the results obtained with the fear filling data set and those various methods are strongly coherent. Okay, um, that means that okay. Um, you could use approximately any method, you would get approximately the same results, which is reassuring in terms of performance. Um, both for QRPM and, and PAG, um, maybe, well, QRPM is very well used. It, it, is, uh, it is a standard algorithm in Phoenix, and, and we could say that most of the population pharmacokinetic analysis are done with QRPM, in fact. Um, we have a bit less experience with NPAG, in particular in the PBPK context. Um, and we also in the PBPK model, uh, yeah, PBPK modeling context, uh, we do not have much experience about the Bayesian method. So that we wanted to, we wanted to understand how they were working. Um, as I mentioned here, uh, the NPAG population variance estimate uh, uh, deviate, but okay, I do not make normality assumptions, uh, NPAC doesn't make normality assumptions, and as I mentioned uh, a few support points. So the quality of the estimates here is not, is not perfect. Now, in terms of computation time, we are interested in also comparing the various methods. They differ largely. MH is fastest, but by, by a lot, okay? Um, but this is also partly implementation dependent. Um, a very minimal code was implemented for the Bayesian sampler, while NPAG, QRPM, they, they do all the work actually uh, uh, of what the P full PBPK model can do. Well, there is an overhead here. Um, NPAG and the Hamiltonian MCMC do about, have about the same uh, runtime. In an hour, we got we got the result. QRPM took a bit longer to stabilize. This this will probably be uh, model dependent, um, data dependent, um, but this gives you an idea approximately what it takes. Um, and 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 we 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 do think that uh, we and we do want to 
have more demonstration or help people uh, use those methods because they are uh, really powerful and, and you can uh, really uh, very easily fit um, quite complex data with those with those methods. Just one little word on perspective. Um, that's what we are working on currently. When you fit a model, you only change the few parameters that you're fitting, obviously. Um, and you in your ignore completely uh, the variability in the other parameters, eventually influencing the data. So maybe you have really selected the most influential parameters, but that means that you have removed a few not so influential parameters, or maybe you have even used a very simple uh, empirical PK approach, which has three parameters, and you have no way to assess what, what is the impact of varying physiology, etc., uh, to which you have access with PBPK modeling. But so in any case, what you do typically is you hope that your parameter estimates are not too sensitive to what you have left out of your uh, of your fitting exercise. And, and you know that you have left out a lot. But when we fit only those um, parameters here, plus this one, we leave out the variability in SimSip about all those parameters. Um, so does that matter? Well, this is exactly what we are exploring. We presented a, a, a poster at page and we are continuing this work. Apparently, we, there is some impact of this. Uh, we are also exploring better accounting of age and, and body mass uncertainty, but that's an aside. Th there is an effect of those, um, those parameters, but it is not huge. Um, and it is mostly sensitive or mostly visible at the individual uh, individual level rather than at the population level. But but um, we are preparing a, a paper and um, we, which we hope to submit uh, later this this year. And so stay tuned for that. Um, just additional resources. I mentioned all this QRPM and PAG. You can find e-learning videos on how to do parameter estimation in SIPSIP on the web uh, members area. And um, actually, I think that on YouTube, some, some will also be posted. Thank you very much. If you have questions, I'm uh, happy to answer them. We have a bit of time, not too much. But... Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. And uh, oh my, my apologies. Uh, oh, that's okay. For whatever reason, the, the link, it took us to another meeting. Oh, I yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I know. Yeah. Five or six of us, we were waiting for <laughs> you guys to join, and you were here waiting for us to okay, come here. I don't know what happened with that. Yeah. 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 Okay, any any question? Obviously, this is a, an evolving area in the area of PBPK. Very, very important, very exciting. And I would say, in terms of the area of PBPK, somehow unique, as Frederick mentioned. Uh, NPAG hasn't been implemented as far as we know in the area of PVPK, so that's the first implementation. And it is good that uh, uh, we are able to compare it, the performance again, QRP, and very established uh, other Bayesian methods. Any questions for Frederick? Either you can unmute yourself and ask the question, or can you you can type it in the chat box. So Frederick, one thing, uh, obviously, from yes. a user perspective is uh, always important, the time. Uh, yes. You showed that for for one of the methods, it uh, took only 1.5 minutes, yes. and you compare yes. it against four hours, so five hours of simulations. Yes. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, the model is minimal PPK model. Do you think if uh, we want to go for a full PPK model and implement are we going to get the same type of results or it will be different? Um, I think that I would have a couple of um, questions. Well, yeah, if the model is more complex. Typically, uh, the, the runtime will be affected. Uh, there is one thing that everybody should be really aware of. You really have to fine tune the integration uh, that is a solver um, settings so that 
really the simulation run as fast as possible and the integration run as fast as possible. So you go to the integration menu and you you can select Ranga Kutta, Sivode, Livermore, and they can really make um, you know an order of magnitude difference. Um, so you do want to really optimize your distribution, don't want to be profligate with your time, even if it seems that you know one model of 10 subject and take 10 seconds, ah, no big deal. Well, uh, you have to realize that thousands of simulations, many thousands of simulations are, are done uh, with, with those, um, inside those methods with, by those algorithms. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that we are really in, in SIPSIP optimizing uh, this and parallelizing the code um, as much as we can. So there is a, a progress we can make in this um, in this uh, and and in this case the more um, cores you will have on your machine or uh, if you run on a network then you can really have paralyzed fast code um, the second or the third uh, point is that well you know also yeah convergent issues they are um, they are linked to the number of parameters you're estimating, to how good a model do you have to fit your data, um, because bad models are more difficult to fit than a good model and take longer. They may even never converge. Um, and yeah, we are also thinking about introducing the Bayesian methods, in particular, if they are that fast, um, that could be interesting to implement. So we, we are looking at that. Okay, thank you very much, Frederick. I don't see any more questions or any question coming through. Uh, can you please move to the next slide? Yeah, so, definitely. <clears throat> so uh, we, we have two more uh, just uh, for to adding to your calendar. Uh, the next uh, webinar in the series is uh, uh, coming from the University of uh, Indiana by uh, Sarah Queeney. Uh, they have recently published a very uh, nice study. They, they looked at the reproducibility of PPPK model and uh, importance of the validation and reproducibility. In this case, they looked at the obstetrical uh, pharmacology uh, in, in pregnancy. But in general, it's a very nice topic and you will be interested to, to see the impact and the observation completely independent uh, uh, way of assessment of what they have done. And the follow up to that one, it will be another presentation. If you go to the next slide, please, Frederick. Yes. Uh, yeah, Amita uh, from uh, SimSip side, she's going to give you an update on the pregnancy and lactation uh, modeling, uh, as well as uh, several case studies that uh, recently we have published. Uh, because all of them, they are very interesting, specifically the last one on, uh, again, on uh, Theophylin. But uh, in that one, she's going to show you how the PPK model is used to predict Theophylin in pregnant women, uh, how much it passed to the uh, breast milk, and how much is getting into the infant. So a uh, very exciting uh, lineup of webinars for the uh, next two two to three months and then uh, we will follow up uh, with, with rest thank you very much uh, everybody and again apologies for the uh, i would call it technical glitch at the beginning uh, thanks for joining and as usual this one is going to be uh, available in the on the youtube uh, very soon thank you frederick for the nice okay. presentation and thanks everybody for joining uh, we can close the uh, webinar thank you thank you